Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another You Be the Behavior Consultant. Did I say that right? Behavior Consultant. <laughs> Came out a little funky there. Monday morning, what can I say? Well, we are back. Uh, last week was our global online animal training series. Hello, Lori from Finland. Glad to have you here. And uh, and and actually, our our um, it was amazing for those of you that didn't catch it, and the recording is available. So we'll talk about that at the end of our, our uh, episode today so you can find out where to access that. And Cynthia's here too. Yay. Oh, and we have some uh, some donkeys in our presentation today. So we'll have some videos clips to look at. Oh, it is a great topic, isn't it? It's a, it's a little bit inspired by some of the things that we talked about in our global online animal training presentation last week. So, um, so yeah. And also by, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, by a, um, a uh, new uh, thing that I'm going to, oh, I don't even, I don't want to give it away yet. Something I'm going to announce at the end of this live stream. Um, good, good evening from Anne over in Denmark. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to announce something at the end of this um, live stream, and um, and so some videoing that videoing that I was doing for that also inspired this live stream today. So um, so it's a little connected to some events that are going on right now. So for our newbies, this is you be the behavior consultant. A live stream I try to do most Mondays. And how does it work? We present a topic for discussion and I've got some questions to prompt our discussion. I'm, I'm certainly hoping that um, everyone here is going to contribute today because I think this is something we can all relate to. It's um, it's a, uh, I know it's something I've certainly experienced and so I know I've got some stories to share. I'm hoping you will too. And I do have some videos to share uh, today that I hope will prompt some discussion and then we'll recap it all at the end. So what we're going to talk about today is um and obviously I've got some you know sort of layman's terms here some labels but we'll get into that a little bit more um so you know can an animal get quote bored with a training session you know do they kind of get over it at some point is it is it you know can we train too much <laughs> so how do we keep training fun so here are my questions to prompt your participation your experiences your discussion oh and ruth is here too and ruth is looking forward to this topic all right so here are my questions for you so have you noticed situations where now again we're talking about a healthy animal um no problems with the animal and, and the animal started responding with sort of a different level of enthusiasm for the training you've been doing with it over time. So say you've been training a certain behavior, you've worked on it, and you start to see the behavior deteriorating. And I also want to add that it's not that your competency as an animal trainer is different. Let's say your competency is very good, you're applying your procedures well, it's not, it's not like you don't understand what you're doing, and you've just been sort of practicing the same behavior and now you see that the animal's kind of going, I'm not really into it anymore. And and I want I'm and I kind of want to find out what you feel like informed you that the animal you know was maybe really into it in the beginning, you know, when you first started training that behavior. And then let's say over a period of time, whether it was weeks or months or days or whatever, that the animal was kind of going, I'm kind of over this. I'm not really into it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we're kind of assuming that the animal's fine. There's nothing wrong with the animal. We're assuming that the trainer is a good trainer. They know what they're doing. Um, what kind of lets you know? What's letting you know that the animal's sort of not into it anymore? And Anne's saying, if I do reps with my collie, he will lay down and not offer behavior. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about here. Exactly. So you start seeing that he just doesn't really participate anymore. He just starts saying, I'm done. <laughs> I like that. That's what I'm. That's what I'm looking about or looking for. Thank you. Um, and then my third question here, of course, is what could we do? You know, if after we start seeing this stuff, to maybe help make sure training sessions um, do remain something what, that our animal wants to participate and and seems to show that kind of enthusiasm. Again, I'm using lots of labels in this conversation, um, but so we get that that appearance of an, you know, an animal that really is eager to participate. So Ruth notices that the behavior starts to get sloppy. For instance, slowly putting a hand to the, heart, the target instead of quickly. Oh, perfect. Yeah, exactly. I see that too. Yeah, that the behavior starts to deteriorate. We don't see quite the fluency that we saw in the past, maybe when we first started um, working on this behavior. Ooh, I like these. Any, anybody else have some examples that they they um, would say? Um, 
Uh, are we assuming satiation of the re reinforcer isn't the issue? Yeah, I'm going to say like, you know, so like say you trained the behavior um, in the beginning, like you, like um, a month ago, and it looked really good. But then when you went to train it a month later and you've been training it every day, on the 30th day, you start seeing that the behavior just doesn't look the same. And, and maybe it's at the beginning of the session, you know, you're comparing beginning of the session a month ago, beginning of the session um, a month later. So maybe the same level of interest in the reinforcer that you're having, that you're offering. So we're kind of assuming conditions are the same. Yeah, that's, that's a good question, Cynthia. So Jordan says, um, animal looking around, repeatedly leaving and taking time to come back, giving beha other behaviors instead. So loss of stimulus control. Okay, yeah. Um, Chris says the attention is easily distracted, like there's a squirrel. <laughs> and Lori says, I can recognize the symptoms within one training session, but ha I have no experience about this in the long run, like in days, weeks, months. Uh, and Cynthia says she understands my comment. Yeah. Um, Ruth says, we want to the, the behavior to remain strong and precise, but you can still add unpredictability, um, fun by making the reinforcement different, but still good. So offering some solutions here. So example, cranberry juice and, uh, or cranberry uh, as a food item instead of apple as a reinforcer. So a solution might be mixing up your reinforcers so that maybe the animal's going, ah, this isn't so predictable what I'm going to get when I do the behavior. Maybe you're offering me something more interesting, so I might in be more excited to do this the next, next time. And so Jordan says, to facilitate enthusiastic participants, I try to vary reinforcers each time and note favored ones. So um, same suggestion that Ruth has there. And Cynthia agrees with Lori. So that um, she, you start, you're, you're starting to, you can recognize when things are starting to not look like the animals is as enthusiastic, but um, in, in, within a, within a training session, but maybe haven't observed it in the long run over, over time. Yeah. And I think sometimes where we might, it might become, obvious is for some for some people they're in a situation where they need a behavior to be repeated frequently like we do have situations where animals participate in um you know like regular presentations or educational presentations and so there's this you know there might be some repetitiveness to their their um behavioral repertoire that they're being asked um soraya says make it fun not very predictable use different um, command levels of energy spent stationary and motion behaviors so use different types of reinforcers like toys versus treats so soraya is also saying maybe mix up the behaviors in addition to the, the variety of reinforcers and and also not just using food reinforcers but include other types of reinforcers um, outside of a uh, of the food realm there. Yeah, and I also like, um, and so maybe the, when you're thinking about the behavior types, what types of behaviors that you're asking, not maybe ones that require different um, types of motions or energy that the animal must, must use. Um, oh, and change the environment. So she's also saying dislocate the, um, in the environment also. So maybe move around into different spaces and environments. So can't how, so you, so Soraya is really suggesting to, really change things up make it make it um much more more interesting so uh so maybe um uh, practice those behaviors in new spaces and and uh um add a lot more stimulation to the entire experience for the animal mm, i'm liking all these suggestions these are great um and laurie says could the repetitive repetitiveness be cut with training different things mixing up new learning new behaviors and maintaining the old behaviors yeah that's it I really like that suggestion I have to admit um you know one of the things that made me think about this was uh something I was working on with my dog and I I realized you know just looking at some things that I, I don't want to give away too much but um uh I watched his his uh, behavior really change when he started working on le learning a new behavior, right? Um, compared to doing something that he already knew. And that was really informative to me. And, and so that's a really good point. I really like that suggestion. That's really fantastic. Ooh, I like these. You guys are coming up with some really good stuff and stuff that I don't even have on my slides. So this is going to be really helpful to people that watch this uh, this replay. Oh, I love it when we get people together and they and they um, you know put all their input in here. We get we get lots of good stuff. 
Yeah, this is good because, uh, um, like I said, I've been working on this new project, which I'll share with you at the end. And so my 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 time has been split in many different directions right now. <laughs> so I'm. This is great. So uh, let's see. For sure, my dog always gets so excited when we start training a new behavior. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Oh yeah, and um, and so maybe that um, hmm. Well, maybe maybe I will go to the slide then. So. So I'm going to put up the slide of, you know, how do we know that an animal is enjoying a training session and, and feel free to keep adding um, into the conversation here. Cause I, I kind of wrote down a few things and obviously there's so much more than this and you guys hit on a bunch of things already, but I think, um, you know, again, Jonathan's presentation made me think about a few things. Like we talked, he talked a little bit about ascent. Somebody asked about that. Um, oh, and Lori said, could a new, could uh, learning a new behavior also work as a reinforcer for doing well in the old ones? Yeah, so like pre-max stuff. Yeah, I, I could see that for sure. Um, I love that idea. Ooh, yeah, very cool idea. Um, so Jonathan talked, you know, somebody asked the question of, you know, can you talk about what's the difference between um, assent and consent? Oh, and Chris says, interspersing old with new behavior learning during a new session also gives the learner a break. Like, oh, good, I know this one. <laughs> yeah, that could be fun. Um, yeah, so Jonathan was talking about assent um, a little bit during his presentation. And, and you guys may recall he mentioned that there's a um, a paper that he and Anna Linehan, who's one of our our, ne our next goats presenter, and um, some other colleagues are working on, which I can't wait till that pre that paper comes out, because I think it's going to, you know, talk about a more systematic way of assessing assent. Uh, and I thought, you know, so some things that are that are informative to us um, about um, assent. Um, so yeah, there's, and actually I'm gonna give us, uh, Anne asked about what is what was assent. And so it's it's more than just saying, yes, I, I'm um, willing to participate because consent, you can agree to do something but not necessarily want to do it. So like you might sign your name to, I'll, I'll agree to the surgery, but you don't really want to do the surgery, but you know, you know you've got to. But assent is more like um, agreeing, agreeing to, and I, and also wanting to do it. Um, and with assent, how we are assessing it in with animals is different than with humans, right? Because we can't get like a verbal verbal agreement, and all. And there are humans that are nonverbal too. And so I think it's really interesting for us as animal trainers. We have we have to figure out these ways to assess assent, right? Which can be um, you know, looking at things like um, body language and all these things that I'm writing down here, which some of you guys are, are talking about. So what does ascent look like in animal training? So, and that's, that's what I have here. And But I think the other thing that I really thought about in Jonathan's presentation was there's different, quote, I would say levels of ascent, right? Because what we're talking about here in this in this particular discussion is that we can get an animal that's like, yeah, 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 I'm really into this. We can animal, we can get an animal that's like, yeah, I know what I'm supposed to do. Here we go again. And then we can also get the animal that's like, well, I'll do it, but man, I really don't want to, you know, it's like, it's, it's sort of like, yeah, fine, I'm doing it, but I think I'm also going to bite you. <laughs> so, um, so this is where it's, it's more complex well, start buttons is another thing. Uh, I would love to teach start buttons for training. Start buttons, there has to be degrees of freedom. So this goes back to um, Sean and Masa's goats presentation. If we use a start button, there has to be several start buttons because if it's just one start button, then it's coercive. And so go back to watch that goats presentation if you haven't watched that one. Um, because if there's only one way to access the reinforcer, then it isn't really true ascent, right? Because then the animal has no other way to access that reinforcer. There has to be more than one way to, to access that reinforcer. So keep that in mind. <laughs> so there can be ascent to begin training if you want to talk about a start button, but there has to be degrees of freedom. Otherwise, it's coercive. But then as, um, as uh, um, Jonathan was talking about, there has to be ways to assess ascent throughout the session. And, um, and so this is kind of where we're getting into what are those levels looking like. And 
And so that might be things like, you know, anticipatory behavior. And some of our animals vocalize when they're kind of excited about something. Some don't. Um, I wrote waiting at the door to go. So like if it's an animal that's in an enclosure and it's eager to come out to participate. Um, maybe it's an animal that comes to you when it sees the stimulus conditions that training's about to start. And it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting at, with you to go do this. Someone mentioned offering behaviors that they know result in reinforcement. Um, some other things I think about is how much effort are they willing to put out in order to gain reinforcers? So, um, you know, how much time are they willing to participate? That might be another thing that tells you uh, if, you know, how enthusiastic they are. Um, and I think this was one that somebody mentioned, what's the latency in terms of how quickly are they willing to um, emit the behavior in response to the SD? Um, we also have to think about um, that history though of also uh, um, what was reinforced and I'll show you a little video that I mean about that. And then what's the attention on the animal trainer? Someone also mentioned that, do they get distracted and start looking at other things? Um, and attention, you know, waiting for that SD for the opportunity to do the behavior. And then I think a really important thing that some of you already mentioned is the body language. So what are some of those species specific postures that we tend to associate with um, certain emotional behavior, you know, so, so is it ears forward? Is it ears back? Is the, t what's the tail doing? What's the feather position? So all those things give us information that we tend to pay attention to. Now there's a lot more that could go on this list. I just threw a few things down there, but let's, let's take a look at some videos that to me, you know, were information. Um, so this was just a tortoise training session and, and, um, I just took a little snippet of it, but but even before we let this animal into the space where we were going to train him, it was kind of like his, or her, as soon as she saw the people and the target, she was like, you know, coming over to this door <laughs> to be let into the space where training was going to occur. And, it, and if you've, some of you, if you've ever worked with large tortoises, you know, they almost become like stalkers. They're just like, oh yeah, I'm coming to wherever you are. And, and she certainly was kind of showing that behavior. What we were trying to work on was um, she, she had, um, you know, accidentally been trained to bite at the target as opposed to just come at it with her mouth closed. And so we, we wanted to practice a little bit of teaching her to keep her, keep her mouth closed when she came towards the target. Oh, you get, you're getting so close, aren't you? So close. <laughs> so are you feeling a little braver? Maybe let her get a little tiny bit closer on the next one? Sure. Oh, she opened her did mouth. Did she? She opened oh, her mouth. I couldn't tell from here. Okay, we'll try, try again then. Good. Oh, really? Oh, I couldn't... Yeah, yeah, it's... If you oh, okay, good. good. You're so close, though, aren't you? Oh. And then, uh, and as long as Chris doesn't mind, I'm going to show some of her cockatoos. Um, and you can always add some comments comments here, Chris, about you know just their eagerness to eagerness to come out and fly. But I think the other thing about them that I think is important to talk about is we talked a little bit about the degrees of freedom and and again their their ability to go other places and get a variety of reinforcers whether it's you know engaging with other things in the environment that they find interesting but all the reinforcement isn't just about you know getting food from people so to speak so i think i hope you'll see that as um as you look at these video clips here Yeah. 
That was very fun. I want to be able to do that. Uh, I know. I wish I was that comfortable yeah. in there. Not getting down. <laughs> no, no. That's that heavy down. Undignified. What the heck? He's usually on the ground, like, is he? playing yeah. with rocks and stuff. It's a little too scary right now. Yeah. Where'd your buddy go? <laughs> Strut your stuff, tight batter girl. <laughs>
at a young age due to his health risks. They don't. They didn't intentionally do that. They don't intentionally do that. I don't think they will ever make, ha, ha, let that happen again. Um, it, but that's just his circumstance. And so, uh, so because of that, that is why he has this dual role of ambassador animal. They don't ever intend to breed him because his genetics aren't significant, um, and and because of his exposure. Um, having been to um, some other places so they have other strategies to increase the population so his role is more ambassador bird but but they still want him to live the quality of life of, of you know of a wild kakapo and so that's that's why he still is you know has his island <laughs> so anyway so this is what it looks like when he uh when he would come hang out with us and and again you know you can kind of see his his interest in participating <laughs> I just like to watch it. You're able to touch this transmitter now too? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think about that? Yeah, it's the odd. <laughs> Good boy. See, there yeah. you can see awesome. the straps. That's and awesome. it's lovely if you end up giving people some vocalizations as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, so just he did lots of that at Mungan Tower Tree. Is it yeah, the stuff that he did? Whoa. That's like Coming from over there. <laughs> <laughs> you sort of look at me. Does the food come from you as well? Put a bit of a screech. Oh, oh, reward, reward. <laughs> Beautiful. And he's like, what? I get food for that? That meringue sort of all curled. What kind of meringue you've eaten? <laughs> That's <is> terrible. <laughs> oh, you mean the look? The look. <laughs> the <laughs> taste. <laughs> Any of this audio, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Here he goes again. Yeah, He's going to. Oh, that audio. Oh, 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 what I noticed that time is. Show us your cockapoo. Oh, there you go. Here he goes. Oh, yay! <laughs> and then it comes in. Good boy. Yeah. Noisy little watermelon, yeah. <laughs> And again, nocturnal, so we would go work with him, you know, like at 9 o'clock at night till about 11 o'clock at night. And he would hang around for a long time, um, which again, you know, another one of those indicators of, you know, how long do they want to want to stick around with you? Uh, OK, and another one I wanted to show you was, um, you know, like how much effort would they put into participating? Yeah, and uh, I used to show this one in my animal training workshops um, uh, in terms of how much work would they do? Hey, pretty girl. Here's pretty Orlando. Girl. Is that a barbell? That's barbell. That's just too funny. I'm sorry. Did you get that one? I did. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, she'll come back. Come and so now I'm, I want to show you um, some, uh, some donkeys. And I want you to just look at their body language. And then we're going to look at another donkey. And then we'll look at that one's body language. These are some some little round donkeys, <laughs> and um and the objective here is that they wanted to teach them to walk on you know on a lead voluntarily, and so we were using some goodies. But now let's take a look at this guy. And I'm going to let this one play a couple times and you guys can maybe uh, note some things that you observe. This is an old video from a consultation I did a long time ago.
Is the donkey afraid of the rod? Uh, I, I don't recall. Um, gosh, it was so long ago. I, I don't know. I don't even remember what the rod was for. But what do you think about that body language compared to what we just saw in the previous video? There are any things you notice? Yeah, ears pinned, tail swish, not perfectly happy, ears are back. But you know, we have voluntary participation. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I was I was thinking about when when I was putting this together, you know. We do see animals do behavior. But it doesn't always look the same, even, you know, and, um, and, and, uh, and I, and I, and rightfully so, I, as I recall, I think this person, that was her concern was that, you know, yeah, I can get this animal to do stuff. And I, and I think if I remember correctly, her concern was that the animal wanted to bite her, um, even though it would do behaviors for her. And, um. And I think that was the problem she wanted to solve. Because as you can see, she's tossing the food on the ground. And I think, as I recall, she was feeding nuts. If I get a tail swish, I need to rethink my training. Attentive, quick to respond, ears back. Sometimes my donkeys are, are back, but she's will, she willingly participates. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but it gives us information, doesn't it? Doesn't it? That, um, that something's up here. Um, that we we want to address you know and so maybe in this case there's some negative reinforcement contingency that you know we need to figure out maybe maybe you know people are an aversive for her maybe the rod uh, the rod is like uh soraya was talking about um so not 100 percent sure um but you know those are things that we we look at um behaviors associated with with coercion or not very cooperative yeah um or cohesion, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's things like this that, that, you know, even though we're seeing voluntary participation, we, we want a heads up on, on those things. Um, so, so I kind of, I kind of go, what might us, what might us, what might inform us animals are losing interest or worse? And, um, uh, let's see. Anna says, my horse pins his ears during certain upward forward movements, but it seems more concentrating to me with my own animal or gathering up. Yeah. And so I'm obviously there's a lot, lot more to evaluate. Um, and, uh, and again, um, Ooh, you know, there's so much here to unpack. And, and I know we have to think about, um, our contingency analysis too, to find out if there's more going on than, than just like in that example, it could be that the aversive stimulus, there's an aversive stimulus in the environment, which means we have a negative reinforcement contingency to address, which is a little different topic than what I was trying to get to. But, um, but, uh, um, what I wanted to, and maybe I have, a, I have some other examples that I'll talk about here that, that we can talk about too, but we, we can think about things that might tell us that the animal may be losing interest. Like if, if we were talking about ascent withdrawal, like the animal takes itself out, removes itself from the participation, maybe that behavior is deteriorating, harder to maintain the fluency. Maybe there's a latency to respond to our, our SD. Um, and, and maybe you're getting to the place where you're having to, you're considering like, maybe I, I have to, you know, make this appetitive more, uh, it was coercion. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, on on the um, Gus's comment there, maybe you're considering more, um, you know, doing something to make that appetitive have more value to evoke a response, or limiting degrees of freedom so that the animal is more likely to respond to whatever appetitive you're using. Um, so, is is actually doing the behavior aversive? Is there some kind of compulsion there? And are and then in 
in um, and going with that, are the stimulus con conditions now becoming a, a, aversive? So now are you starting to see precursors to aggression? So is body language associated with aggressive behavior um, observed? And now are you getting aggressive responses? And so I think maybe I have a couple examples that maybe better illustrate that that I'm going I'm going to talk about. Um, as opposed to, and, and the donkey video may not may not have been the perfect example because there may have been an aversive stimulus in the environment that that I you know just don't remember from my past working there, but I have two videos or stories I should say from past experiences where with my own training where I do feel like what was happening is that the training itself had become so repetitive that the animal was basically saying the training itself, it's not that, you know, there's an aversive stimulus in the environment that I couldn't identify. It's that the, the repetitive nature of this training is becoming aversive. So one of them was this one um, goes with this video and this is where you will see, I've shared this one before, but this is where my bird bit me. Um, can the value of the appetitive elicit different responses in the behavior? Yeah, I think we did talk, I think that's kind of what we talked about um, earlier where when solution might be, if you, if you do have to do the behavior over and over again, might be to change up your, your reinforcers. I think that can help. But in this case, I didn't really need to do this behavior over and over again. Um, I was just filming something and I got to the point where I, I just asked it so much that I got an aggressive response. You guys have seen this video before, but I'll show it again. So I love the, are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> so in that, so the backstory on that is I was filming something, how yellow nape says, no, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So what, so he actually didn't bite me hard, but he definitely is showing an aggressive response there. And, and what had happened is I was, I was film. He already knows the behavior of stepping up on my hand. I don't normally use a target stick to um, to do that behavior, but I wanted to film something where I demonstrated how to train the behavior of step up on the hand using a target stick. And so I was kind of, you know, faking it in a sense where I had him do some targeting and then I used the target stick to to demonstrate that behavior. And I just kept kind of getting different shots of it. And so I was just doing it over and over and over again. And he finally got to the point where he was like, I'm over it. <laughs> and he's like, and I'm going to tell you I'm over it by biting you. And he had already pinned his eyes a couple times and I ignored that. And so me ignoring that led to him escalating with a bite. And, um, and so I think that's a good example of what I'm talking about here in this, in this, um, uh, particular live stream where, um, where this was an animal telling me the repetitive of this is now aversive. This is no longer a fun thing. I don't care about your, your food isn't going to make it any better <laughs> there. You know, whatever you're offering me as a, you know, a, a, an appetitive afterwards is not going to make this better. You've pushed this too far. I'm done. Um, so, so this is what I'm kind of talking about how, you know, us assessing the animal's enthusiasm to participate along this, it, you know, it changes, right? It changes, you know, where, you know, you might have this animal that's like really, really into it, this animal that's willing to do it, and this animal that's like, no more. And so I didn't do a good job of assessing. Um, and so I, he went to the place of no more, and I'm letting you know as loud as I possibly can without really hurting you. And, um, and so, so that's, this is kind of what I was trying to get to here. So another one is my rabbit. So this is the behavior that, um, that she was trained to do and, you know, typically would do it with great, great uh, enthusiasm. And this was her in the early stages of it. 
I don't think this has audio, so uh, I can probably talk over it. But yeah, this is when she first learned to do the behavior, and it was, yeah, I have a little slow motion of it. <laughs> she was all, this is fun. So um, let me uh, get back to here. Um, and uh, and she, uh, she was scheduled to do this on some live TV thing. And so she was obviously, like many animals, great at doing it in, um, in a specific space. I retrained it on a tabletop with some yoga mats so that, um, that I could keep things as consistent as possible in a new environment. So the yoga mats would, you know, have her scent on it. She, when a rabbit's on a table, they tend not to jump off a table unless you go to grab them or something like that. Um, it would confine the location and I could use all the same familiar props so she'd be less likely to be distracted by a new environment. Uh, what I then wanted to do was practice this in new rooms uh, so that hopefully it would generalize to a brand new environment. So I would practice it in different rooms in the house, but then I would also take it to like the post office on a Sunday when nobody's there. Um, there was a rehearsal studio um, in my neighborhood for musicians and I could, I could practice there as well. But the thing was, I did it so much thinking that the more I do it, the better that when I take her to the television studio, she'll be great. But she got to a point where she was like, oh, this, I'm just so sick of doing this behavior. I, and the way that I started to see that is the behavior just started deteriorating and it got worse and worse and worse. And, um, and it didn't matter in terms of what was being offered as a reinforcer. I just saw the behavior in, go down and down and down and down. And I don't really think it had anything to do with, you know, she knew the behavior, so to speak. She had so much reinforcement history for it. She wasn't distracted by the environment. Um, I don't think the, the, the stimulus conditions outside mattered anymore. I really think it was just, she was just so sick of being asked to do this behavior. Uh, Gus says the downside of an example like that with dogs is, is that as they find the behavior fun as you make you jump, just, you just shaped a brand new behavior that they'll remember for a long time. Mm. <laughs> yeah, your reaction to, to set, unfortunately setting it up to the point that it, it went so bad that you got bit. Mm. Yeah, talking about the parrot biting. Um, yeah, so I, and I will say, and, and, uh, and when I did bring my rabbit to, um, we did two de television things, and one place she did it perfect in the rehearsal, and of course didn't do it on the, uh, um, uh, when actual filming happened. <laughs> so, so, you know, all that work, and it, and it really kind of made it fall apart. So, um, <clears throat> so, I, so that to me was a really important learning lesson. And, uh, and then I think... Uh, and what I will switch to here um, now is, I, I think a really important lesson I've learned through all of this, and one of our live streams that you guys may recall that has been really informative for me, is that um, our animals remember a lot. We don't really need to do so much repetition. <laughs> <laughs> is what I'm finding. Um, I think once these animals get to fluency, we probably don't need to ask the behavior so frequently. Um, and, uh, and then I think if we do have one of those situations in which we did evoke an aggressive response, one of the things we can consider is remember that, you know, in that live stream, helping animals remember or forget, is that, you know, that aggressive response occurred under certain stimulus conditions. So all those conditions are now, you know, a part of that, that response. So one thing you might consider is retraining under different stimulus conditions so that that aggressive response is less likely to be attached to that. And, um, and you know, I think the thing that really, you know, sparked this for me, like I said, I've been working on this new project, is that I, I asked my dog to do a behavior that I'll show you in just a minute here, a little snippet of it. Um, over the weekend that I hadn't asked him to do in months and months and months and months and months. And he remembered everything to perfection. And he was so excited to do it. He was just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is so fun. Um, and, uh, and so 
you know, that was that to me was very informative. That really, uh, you know, gave me a lot of information that, you know, this this constant repetition, I think, can, especially once that behavior is fluent, you know, can potentially be detrimental. You know, we might want to think about that. So so like as was suggested over here, keeping keeping the variety, you know, and maybe having a nice big repertoire can be really helpful. Um, Cynthia says, I've come back months later to a client's doc donkey and they do the behaviors just as well as months prior. Yeah, yeah. So that goes back to our live stream about helping animals remember or helping them forget. Um, uh, so again, building up that wide repertoire of behaviors to allow for more variability that you all suggest suggested earlier and looking for and using more reinforcers, and especially if we can think about the functional reinforcers. So what is your animal really looking for? Does it want attention from you? Um, and, you know, does it like like, you know, we saw with Chris's birds, the flying itself is really reinforcing. Uh, Gus says, with my dogs, I, I kept some of the toys as pups as reinforcers and they can't get enough. Ah, yeah. So the ones they really enjoyed when they were little ones. Um, and I think, um, and, and sometimes, you know, we can think about shorter sessions instead of, you know, super, super long ones. If you think animals are losing interest um, from the really long, you know, a long intensive you know, I got to do a training session for a long time. Um, but, you know, again, I go, it depends, you know, I do kind of pay attention to what the animal's into. I don't necessarily have a hard and fast rule that it has to be a certain amount of time. But, but again, you can pay attention to your animal. And I also try to think about that training isn't an isolated event. Um, you know, all your interactions, um, our training sessions, right? So, you know, I'm always thinking about like my dog absolutely loves being scratched all over, especially at his butt, you know, so that is such a huge reinforcer for him. So he often comes into the room just looking for a butt scratch. And, and I think about that, you know, I love that he checks in with me. He's not stuck to me like glue, like he right now he's passed out on the bed because it's cold out and he likes to be curled up in the, in the covers. So when he checks in with me and I, I scratch him on his butt, you know, he loves that. So, um, so I think about those things. And, you know, my macaw who's back here, she loves face-to-face -face interactions. So I give her, you know, little head movements back and forth. That's a big reinforcer for her. I'm not thinking about, oh, I got to grab treats. You know, that's not what she wants. Um, but I do think about what I'm reinforcing too when, they, when they're seeking those, those functional reinforcers. So, you know, so stay in touch with your behaviors and assess the response regularly. So, so throughout the whole process of an animal doing behaviors, we're assessing, you know, and, and so it's not just running through behaviors because you think you should. I see that a lot in the zoo community. It's like, oh, today we have to have a training session and today we have to work, you know, on this repertoire of behaviors in order to maintain it. And I think maybe we need to kind of move away from that. It's not probably necessary to, you know, run through this strict routine, so to speak. Um, and again, you know, getting comfy with assessing for ascent and, and looking for degrees of freedom, you know, how many ways can animals access reinforcers so they're not, it's not feeling like they're coerced into having to get it only through your training session. So I wanted to let you see this video of Luther, what he looked like when I was like, we're going to, we're going to go back and revisit this behavior. I mean, he was, and I'm just going to show you a snippet because uh, it'll lead into what this project is that I'm working on. Are you ready? You want to start this? Come on, let's do this. What is that? What's your answer? <laughs> what a good boy. Get your bike. I know you see it. <laughs> you already know how to do this. All right, I got treats on top. You ready? <laughs> Hopefully you can see how happy he's there. So Gus says, um, 
we have to tell that to all the super and supervisors and bosses out there that they need that that need all the training done yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, to or to keep their cool until the animals are ready. Yeah, yeah, it is it is hard, isn't it? Um, and Anna Anne says he's a he's a handsome boy. Um, Chris says when my twos are out flying is a great time for me to do their spot training. Right? Yeah. So it's it's not a training session per se. You just kind of take your opportunities when when you see that they're like, oh, hey, I'm into it now. Um, everyone is eager to participate. Yeah. So you're assessing and in that moment and uh, and uh, as opposed to like scheduled training sessions, so to speak. Um, all right. So I uh, just uh, oh and. Uh, he reminds me of the dog from John Wick's three. Oh, I haven't watched that. I guess I'm going to have to go look for that. Yeah, he's just a, um, oh, sorry for branching out. Oh, it's okay. That's what we're here for. This is not formal. This is supposed to be fun, fun, interactive stuff uh, um, for everyone to participate in. Yeah, no, I um, I adopted him from the shelter. Uh, I just looked at, uh, I had a photo, actually. I looked at, I was looking through my photos on my phone. It was 2018, Christmas at 2018, so um, and he was super skinny. Uh, so I'll have to show a before and after photo. I'll, maybe I'll post that in the Facebook group. Um, yeah, so so I've had him for a few years now. Um, but, I, you know, I don't know how old he was then. And I just, I used some tips from Al if he's on here today to, to help me uh, choose a, a good guy. And he's a sweet, sweet dog. Loves people, loves other dogs. And, you know, just a, a, a very, very happy boy. So, um, so to recap here, um, ascent is super important in animal training at both the beginning and throughout the training session. However, we may also want to investigate, quote, that level of ascent. Further investigation reveals it's really on a continuum, right? It just doesn't stay at one level. So this means ideally we, we would get that enthusiastic, eager participant at best. And, you know, if we can't get that, hopefully we get a satisfied voluntary participant at minimum. However, I think if we get really, you know, redundant, you know, or if there's compulsion, if we limit degrees of freedom, we can lead to situations which ascent seems apparent and training sessions maybe are not so much fun for our animals. So we kind of keep an eye, an eye out for that. Um, we can be proactive and avoid the potential pitfalls by maybe not being too unnecessarily repetitive in our request for responses, especially once that animal's at fluency with the behavior. And, um, and remember that animals can retain responses well. Um, so that's a big one, you know, I think is really eye-opening for a lot of us. We want to avoid falling into routine too much and really practice continually assessing those, you know, the body language, um, behaviors for a throughout the process uh, and uh, as well as all those other suggestions that we covered. I don't want to repeat the whole live stream again in our recap. Anyway, so um, so those uh, that was our, our live stream for today. Um, we do have a, an old uh, UB the Behavior Consultant on Ascent versus Consent because so, um, uh, you know we're trying to switch the language over in the animal training community there's a tendency to use the word cons consent but you know animals can't really consent we can't sign they can't sign a document. Um, and again, the other one, the other live stream is helping animals remember and helping um, helping animals remember or forget, which is another live stream we did, which is a good one. That's relevant. And then, of course, the the goats lecture or presentation on degrees of freedom that Sean Will and Masa Nishimuta did is a really good one um, as well. That's relevant to this. And so here is the new project I'm working on, which I hope to announce tomorrow. I just have to wrap up a few things. We're gonna do a behavior challenge and it's totally free to anybody who wants to participate. So you may remember that super cool open mouth behavior shaping plan that I developed over the pandemic and I shared um, online. Hopefully you can see that photo <laughs> of my uh, dog there putting his mouth on those two bars there. And then um, the Copenhagen Zoo, Anetta Peterson, they also shaped the behavior with a panda and um, and so what we're going to do is if anybody who wants to participate in this, you, you certainly can, you're all welcome to, there is a web page at behaviorchallenge.com and I just haven't made the registration yet there. I hope to have it ready tomorrow uh, and I'll send out announcements on social media and also through email. What, you, what will happen is you will um, be guided through how to train the behavior. And so you'll get um, 
you'll get an email um you know over five days you'll get little video clips with with um short instruction that's only they're like a minute or two long i think three minutes is the longest video you'll get digital downloads to check off your progress and the other cool thing is we have a private facebook group so anybody who joins the challenge you get to an invite to this private facebook book group where you get to, you know, like share video clips of your training. You get to talk about like maybe what kind of setup you created. Um, you can post pictures. You can chat with anybody else who's doing the challenge. And then we'll also do a live stream in there um, each each of the five days where we'll chat as well. So um, so 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 think about you know if you've got we can there's many different species that you could apply this to. I you know I've seen people um, copy the plan with parrots. You could do it with bears you could do it with dogs you could do it with foxes you could do it with raccoons you know there's there's many different species this could be applied to so if you want to participate um i will be posting hopefully tomorrow if i can finish up all the details that i need to do today um if not i think wednesday at the latest or tuesday or wednesday at the latest i'll get i'll get it all um all set up so but you can kind of get a sneak preview the, the web page is up it's just the button to register isn't uh isn't um active just yet but that is that and then there's another challenge um, I'm gonna do in um, April and you'll also see that listed on that page yet but we'll save that announcement for later but you can read up on it if you go to that page so there you go that's what I've been working on I'm very excited about it so I hope you guys will participate all right and then the other news um the goats presentation on uh the psychomotor repertoires that was so cool people loved it loved it loved it the replay is available if you're a member you you'll see it in the program so you can watch the replay there if you're um if you're not a member uh there are options at atfgoats.com to watch that and then don't forget we've got anna linehan is coming up with um, a great presentation on emotions and emotional behavior so so that one's in February, so get on the list for that one. Uh, and if you're a member, I did want to mention that I put even more resources in the affiliate program. So um, when you go to your dashboard, just click on affiliate area and you'll see more information about that. The affiliate FAQs tells you more about how to use these resources. So now there's 32 images in there, so it's pretty cool. And then here is a citation for today's um, uh, like our live stream. And of course, if you're not a member, here is all your cool options and that's it for today we covered a lot so let me read your comments uh uh everybody's liking the idea of the behavior challenge so we've got how fun yes i can see it um cool sounds great this is going to be fun oh john wick two and three that that i check okay so i'm gonna have to watch john wick well i need something new to watch <laughs> sounds fun on the challenge i definitely need to go watch that dante's here oh this is and she's coming getting on our participants thank you thank you barbara all right cool idea so we're just getting lots of nice nice comments from everybody all right well you guys uh like i said i'm i've been busy cranking out uh the work lately to you know i i I think, you know, just make some fun things for you guys that I think are really going to be cool and fun for everybody to, um, you know, just do some more training and application and interactive stuff. I'm really excited about the challenge that will be after that too, but we'll share that one later. All right. So I love the idea of the challenge from Jordan. Thanks. Uh, saying thanks. And yeah, so um, I'll be posting more information about that soon too. So keep your eyes posted for that. I don't want to keep you all too late. Um, and obviously I'm going to, get editing on our live stream today and get that posted in animaltrainingfundamentals.com and finish up all the prep for the challenge so that I can announce that and get you all signed up so that we can uh, do that. So it's that I'm scheduling that for February 20th through 25th. So it'll be coming up soon. And then the next challenge will be in April, which is a more uh, intense one, but, but it's going to be really good. I'm really excited about that one. All right, there you go, guys. Fun times ahead. Lots of fun animal training. And thank you for being here. Cynthia says, thanks a million. Um, this is a great one. I, I enjoyed this one a lot. Thank you for being here. So um, look forward to the next one. And uh, Anna says, so great. Thank you. All right, guys. I hope you have a great day. Stay warm. It's a little chilly down here in Texas. But, um, you know, it is what it is. It is winter. So, <laughs> all right. Take care, you guys. We will talk to you later. Bye.